today and thinking about how to think about in particular for the beautiful and very important Commonwealth of the country. Very gracious. And um, I'm very honoured to be standing here on Royal Dream Land. So thank you very much to the eldest past president of Future as well. All right, I want to start by asking you all a question. You don't need to uh, shout out your answer, put up your hand. I just want you to do this in your mind. I want you to do one of those free word associations, you know, where I say a word and you just think of the first thing that comes to mind. You don't need to say it all, I just think it. When I say the word Muslim, I want you to think of the first three words that come to mind. Okay, you don't need to say it, just, just file them away. And now I want you, you don't have to share them, so you can be really honest with yourself. And now I want you to think of the first three words that come to mind when I say Muslim woman. So just think easily, what are your instant gut reactions when I ask you to, to do a, a word association? Now, if any of your words were less than favourable, um, you're not alone. Uh, Dr. Zach Matthews mentioned a, a study that came out in 2012 about 25% of Australians having identified themselves as having anti-Muslim attitude. In fact, uh, a lot of the ones have come out from the University of Western Sydney it was a 10-year-long uh, study, so a decade long, and they found that nearly 50% of Australians self-identify as having anti-Muslim attitudes. And that was the highest category. It was higher than anti-Semitic attitudes, it was higher than anti-Aboriginal attitudes, it was higher than anti-Asian attitudes. And other studies have shown similar results, um, with Muslims being the group that Australians least want their families to marry. And there have been some pretty depressing studies about the nature and the frequency of attacks on Muslims. Um, and often mostly Muslim women. Um, so studies have shown us that non-Muslim Australians often feel uneasy about Muslims. Um, and sometimes there is outright hostility, uh, even violence, as we saw recently, uh, with the unfortunate spate of attacks on uh, just random Muslim women in Melbourne and Sydney in particular, and in Brisbane, some pretty um, unfortunate, unpleasant attacks after the, the recent terror raids. So we, there is definitely a, a there's a tension in a decent proportion of Australian society. Now I'm going to give you a few more statistics, and I can't help that because I'm a sociologist and that's what I love, but try to stay with me because I promise there's a point beyond just a, a bullet point. There's a reason I'm sharing this with you. Um, similar results were found in the United States about attitudes towards Muslims. Um, in 2005, Gallup asked uh, Americans, what do you admire most um, about a Muslim society? So they ask the average American person, what do you admire most? And the most common answer was nothing. There is nothing I admire about Muslims. The second most frequent was, I don't know. A third of Americans believe that um, Muslims are sympathetic to Al-Qaeda and 22% don't want Muslims as neighbours. Um, similarly, in Australia, a 2011 poll conducted by The Age uh, asked people, are you concerned about the number of Muslims in Australia? 25% of Australians said they wanted Muslims excluded from Australia's immigration intake. 57% believed Islam was as fast as growing religion. And 57% were concerned about the number of Muslims in Australia. And like I said, there's a lot of stats to take in. Now, I'm not saying this to depress anyone, and I'm not saying this to put anyone on the defensive, and I'm certainly not saying this just to have a whinge. There is a reason. The reason I think this is important is because what is most striking about these polls isn't that people have anti-Muslim attitudes. It was that they're not, their fears and dislike were based on false belief or lack of information or lack of personal knowledge. So as you remember, Zach Matthews said, Islam isn't the fastest growing religion in Australia, Hinduism is. And the reason that's significant is when people in the poll that I told you about from the age were told this, their concern about Islamic, Islamic migration fell instantly. As soon as they were told, you know, you know Islam is not the fastest growing religion in Australia, instantly the fear dropped and the, the percentage of people in Australia who said we should cut Islamic migration dropped. The same thing happened in the US. Remember the 22%, sorry, the 25% of Americans who said they didn't want a Muslim as a neighbour? If they personally knew a neighbour, uh, sorry, if they personally knew a Muslim, that figure dropped to 10%. So suddenly 15% was instantly dropped if they happened to know a Muslim. <laughs> so it's a misunderstanding and misinformation and a lack of personal experience that makes a huge difference in how the average non-Muslim Australian feels about the average Muslim Australian. 
So it's these studies plus my own personal experience that shows it's not willful hate as much as ignorance and a lack of information that can create these tensions. And that's why I think events like today and the Faith Fashion Fusion exhibition are so important because it's a chance to clarify things and change the wrong way that we, we can be thinking. Um, so that's the terrain that I, as a Muslim woman, exist in Australia and other Muslim women in Australia exist. And I've been asked to speak to you today on the topic of Muslim women in Australia, the personal and the political. Um, and these issues, as Dr. Zach Matthew said, these issues are fed by both Muslim and non-Muslim community issues. <coughs> the way that Australian Muslims, and in particular Australian Muslim women, connect with broader society to try to change these negative perceptions um, and be engaged as civic agents is really interesting and it's fascinating and it's broad. And I want to tell you about some of the things that I've been involved in, not just because I think my own stories are particularly interesting, but because I think they are a, they give a good example of um, the way perceptions can change and be just staggering, even to me, someone who's been a Muslim for 16 years, the staggering lack of um, information people have about what a Muslim really is, what a Muslim woman really is. So the first thing I want to tell you about is a TV show that I was part of. Um, now, if we judge Australian society by what we see on TV or by our politicians, we would assume that we're, by and large, a pretty monocultural bunch. The vast majority of soaps and TV shows have uh, Anglo-Saxon people as the, the, dominant, the, the dominant face we see. Um, our political leaders are mostly white. Um, but our soap opera stars and our politicians don't really reflect the reality on Australian streets. Um, about a quarter of Australians were born overseas. More than 50% of us have at least one parent who was born overseas. So we're actually a really multicultural society, but we don't see that really reflected much in our TVs. Now, you might think that doesn't really matter. What's the big deal? It's just entertainment. They're just our leaders. Um, or, you, you know, that when Muslims do appear on TV, it's normally as the latest terror suspects in the nightly news, and that's about it. Um, or that the only time politicians really seem to comment on Muslims is to address our alleged lack of integration, or um, they love to comment on the way Muslim women dress. That seems to come up quite a lot. Um, but I think it does matter. I think, I think that is something that's important. In a study that I told you about earlier, the one where half of Australians identified themselves as having anti-Muslim attitudes, the, re the lead researcher, Professor Dunn, says, if you continue to speak about a group as a problem, whether that be asylum seekers or Muslims, they will be cast as that within the public mind. So it was in this vein that I was part of a TV show called Salam Cafe. It first started on community TV and then later went on to the National Broadcast to SBS. Being part of Salam Cafe was probably one of the, the biggest contributions I've made to try to change the way Muslims are perceived. And I say it's knowing that the majority of you probably never saw it, the majority of you probably never even heard of it, but that's okay. Part of the importance of Salam Cafe was simply that it existed and that some people knew about it, both Muslim and non-Muslim. Um, it was a comedy uh, panel and sketch show and it started one night in our lounge room when my husband and I were playing board games with friends. When you don't drink, that's what you do for entertainment. And we were moaning about the way Muslims were represented on TV. Um, you know, we were just saying, oh, there's such a hatchet job, it's so terrible. And our friend said to us, well, why don't we have our own TV show? And we thought, yeah, that could be cool, like the Cosby show, you know, we could really change the way people think about um, minorities and that sort of thing. And then, to be honest, my husband and I didn't give it any more thought, but our friend did. And he went and lobbied the community TV people to let us have our own show. And they were quite sceptical at first. I think they thought we were the Western propagation wing of Al-Qaeda. But eventually, <laughs> they relented. They did eventually. We really worked them hard and, and they came around and, and then they let us have a go. And I can cheerfully acknowledge we were pretty woeful. None of us knew anything. None of us had been on TV. Um, and it showed. <laughs> it showed that we didn't really know what we were doing. But in many ways, like I said, our skill level was secondary to the fact that the show simply existed. In Australia, as I'm sure you all know, there is a lot of currency in self-deprecating humour. Um, you know, humour where you can make fun of yourself. Um, and we employed that a lot on Salam Cafe. A group of people can make fun of themselves in a way that outsiders cannot. But we were also quite happy to make fun of the way non-Muslims viewed us. 
Um, we debated issues amongst ourselves, and that in itself seemed to be a revelation to our mostly non-Muslim audience who couldn't believe that there wasn't this monolith of Islamic opinion that, wow, Muslims actually do disagree with each other on things. Um, and the response was fascinating. We won Program of the Year at the National Community TV Awards. Um, the Sydney Morning Herald voted us you know, the show of the week. We got really kind reviews. But what was most telling, and something to this day, you know, Sloan Cafe, Sloan Cafe finished in 2008, and I still, this still sticks in my head that the kind of emails we got, this was before Twitter, thank God, but we got a lot of um, emails from people, and you know, obviously we got some pretty unpleasant hate mail, as you can imagine, if you can't imagine, I'm going to paint a picture because it was horrific. <coughs> but we also got emails from non Muslims, and what I'll never forget was a guy who wrote in and said, I was just flicking channel and I saw you on TV laughing. I didn't know Muslims were allowed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> now, when the dominant perception of you is either total ignorance or entirely negative, you can alter things radically just by presenting yourself as a human being, which is what we're trying to do. And the impact of having Muslim women on the show, sitting alongside men, disagreeing with them, making jokes, being opinionated, seemed to blow a lot of people's minds. Because when the only exposure many Australians have, um, have to Muslim women is the depressing caricature we see as the perpetual victim, she's oppressed by her husband and her sexist <laughs> religion, She's a personality, personality less robot. Like I said, it can be truly radical just to show us as nuanced human beings with opinions. A TV show has a lot of potential to reach the kind of people that would never come to you know, a church hall. I've, I've done a lot of interfaith activities and they are good and important and I don't regret any of them. But often it could feel like I was just, we were all just singing to the choir. The kind of people who come to the church hall to have a cup of tea and a biscuit and share stories are the kind of people you don't really need to convince them much anyway. But something like a TV show or those sort of mass produced things can really um, reach an audience that would otherwise never want to hear or have an opportunity to hear what a Muslim says. And like I said, even though it finished in 2008, I still have people come up to me on the street, people still up to my husband on the street saying, when's Lion Cafe going to start again? And for all our awkward delivery, I really believe we've had something of an impact about the conversation of Muslims in Australia. Because I really think when you're, uh, for any minority group, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And the Lion Cafe, like, once Lion Cafe, <laughs> it wasn't us just being at the table, we were serving up the meal as well. We were having a say about how we, for once, and not to say we were the only people doing anything important, but in that paradigm, we were starting to have control of the way we talked about and what was being said about us. Before then, everybody was just talking about us. And finally, Muslims were starting to control the, the conversation as well. And I think faith, fashion, fusion is another example. You know, I think it would be very easy to dismiss it as something that's just superficial, um, that's just based on clothes, but I think that's really wrong. Um, the, the exhibitions were really careful to include the words of Muslim women, um, to show them as articulate, thinking individuals, discussing numerous issues that are important to them. And it took an issue that can be incredibly controversial in Australia, which is the way that Muslim women dress, and it not only showed it in a new light, but it demonstrated that it was something that Muslim women felt proud of, and that they expressed agency over and used as a form of worship. And it also showed the average non-Muslim Australian that Australian Muslim women saw their faith as something that was distinctly Australian, that it had outside cultural influences, absolutely, but it was also something that was organically Australian as well, that Islam is part of the mainstream Australian existence. Now, when you remember, like Zach said, that um, there's only about 500,000 Muslims in Australia out of a, a population of 23 million, um, we need to remember the majority of Australians will probably never meet a Muslim, never speak to a Muslim, or have a Muslim friend. Um, and so, like I said, in the studies that I mentioned earlier show the importance of knowing a Muslim personally can change that negative opinion. I think things like faith, fashion, fusion, these sort of conversations are a chance for big conversations to happen for people that might not have a Muslim li living next door to them. 
I met with a Muslim, uh, sorry, I met with a non-Muslim woman recently, a lovely lady, um, and she said to me, you know that the majority of Australians think that Muslim women are oppressed. And I said, okay. So do you all these people that you're speaking about, do you have any Muslim female friends? And she said, no, I don't. I said, do you know any Muslim women at all? And she said, no. And I said, have you ever spoken to a Muslim woman? And she said, before you know. I said, so do you or the people that you're talking about consider that maybe you might not have the full picture about Muslim women? <laughs> I think all you know is from headlines and hashtags and sound bites. It could be a little bit more to Muslim women and their lives and their desires and their beliefs and what they agree with and what they don't agree with. It could be a bit more than what you're seeing, you know, on Fox News. And so, yes, maybe it could. And so, when, as I said before, often when you're a Muslim woman, you can feel that you're spoken about. You can feel that, especially the way we dress is talked about. We talked about as if we're not even in the room. And I think things like faith, fashion, fusion, a really important opportunity for Muslim women to speak, to them, uh, speak for themselves. The other area where I think Australian Muslim women are making important developments is within the Muslim community itself. Because yes, the stereotypes about Muslim women, that we're all oppressed, that we all have misogynistic fathers or husbands, um, that our faith is the worst women on the planet, that we have no autonomy, all that is ugly and unfair, I can say that. But like any other community or group of people, like Auntie Isabel said, we're people, we have our problems, sexism happens to us too. And I do not believe I do any favours to my sisterhood by pretending it doesn't happen, by sweeping under the carpet, and I don't think it honours my religion um, to pretend sexist cultural practices are acceptable, as Zach spoke about. We still have mosque boards that won't allow women to sit on them, or Islamic organisations that don't include women fairly. We have Muslims who are hypercritical about the way Muslim women dress, and like all communities, we have the scourge of domestic violence. I've devoted my PhD research to Muslim women who are actively working to change things in that area, and for many more years than I would like to admit, I have researched and interviewed Muslim women in, in Australia and overseas who fight sexism within the Muslim community. I've spoken to theologians, activists, writers and bloggers, and I ask them about the way they fight sexism within the Muslim community. Often when I tell non-Muslims about my research, they are surprised. They genuinely do not feel, or genuinely didn't believe that such women even existed, uh, let alone that there would be enough to fill a 100,000 word PhD thesis on. They're even more surprised when I say to them, these women are nothing new. Muslim women have been fighting sexism within the Muslim community since the advent of Islam. And not only that, many men are our most committed partners and helpers in this regard. You know, the women I interviewed, when I asked them, who were your biggest supporters in what you're trying to do? The first category, they all said, was um, female friends. The second category for all of them was always a Muslim man, whether it be their husband, their teacher, their father, all of them had. The second most common supporter was a Muslim man. So this isn't about Muslim women fighting against Muslim men. This is about a cohesive group of people trying to eradicate something very negative. One of the most significant things to come from my research is that the vast majority of women say they do what they do because they feel the sexism that exists in the Muslim community is dishonouring to their faith. That far from seeing their religion as part of the problem, they see Islam as the tool they can use to change things. In fact, all but one of the women I interviewed said that fighting sexism through an Islamic prism is the only way to create effective, lasting change. Now, these women took different approaches. They, some had a very gently, gently approach. Other women were getting arrested for the things they were doing. But all were committed and all were passionate Muslim women in addressing the issues and challenges that they saw that Muslim women faced. And they were concretely, concretely altering the terrain that Muslims operate in. As I pointed out, it can be the trickiest time to be a Muslim woman living in Australia. Sometimes we can feel like we are being criticised from both sides. And the women that I spoke to for my PhD brought this up a lot, and I can give you an example to illustrate this. I was going to the opening of Faith Fashion Fusion in Melbourne. It was in a museum in the city. So I took the train and I was wearing what I thought was quite a nice outfit, nice hijab, it matched my outfit. And as I was walking from the train to the museum, this guy in the street said something really rude and abusive to me. 
about being Muslim. And I remember thinking at the time, that's kind of ironic that I'm going to a mm. you know a, a exhibition that's all about promoting whatever that you know happens and kind of felt sad about it as anyone would be abused by a stranger on the street. Trying not to let it get to me. When I was at the museum, <laughs> someone took a photo of me and posted it on my Facebook page. I was standing with my friends, and as soon as it was posted, a Muslim guy wrote to the comment, that is the incorrect way for a Muslim woman to be dressing. <laughs> and I remember saying to my husband, it creates such a sad microcosm of how it can be to be a Muslim woman. You can feel like you're being criticised from both sides. It can be hard, especially when you're a visible Muslim woman, when you wear the hijab. Um, it can be really challenging. It can feel difficult. Um, that being said, um, it is by no means all written. Um, you know, and especially in Australia, we have now hijab wearing police officers um, and lifesavers. Uh, we have a hijab wearing TV reporter now. Um, we have our first Muslim woman um, who is in Australian Parliament. And the Muslim women that I interview uh, for my PhD show me that which the community is changing for the better um, in many ways. So there aren't only issues and challenges, and it would be dishonest of me to sort of end by making it sound like everything's horrific. There are definitely difficulties, um, but the good definitely outweighs the bad. Yes, I get some horrible hate mail, um, and I get abused on the street. There was the time that I went to a, a meeting at a national television network that invited me to come and help to a production meeting to develop a new TV show. And when I got there, the woman thought, the receptionist thought I was there to fix her phones. <laughs> there was a time I was at my university as a lecturer to lecture, I have hundreds, I think I had 600 undergraduate students that year. And I was there to do my lecture and the other staff just assumed I was a student. Oh, you sit over here, I'm like, no, no, I'm actually, I'm meant to be up here. So there can be these assumptions that we, difficult, that we deal with and it can be funny and it can be frustrating. Um, but I can honestly say I do not want to raise my daughter as a Muslim in any country other than here, or my son for that matter. Um, there is a huge amount of opportunity and positivity. And in these situations, I think all of us have a choice. We can be hopeful and work to make things better and more cohesive and focus on the good, or we can sit on the sidelines and we can criticise and we can complain. And I want to be on the positive side. I think there is good reason to today. Events like today make me feel like there is very good reason to. So thank you very much for having me and I look forward to hearing your questions.